Welcome. My name is Jim Bensley, and I am the Interim Director of NMZ's International Affairs Forum. We're pleased to have you tuned into this critical presentation today. And I know one that's very near and dear to many of you uh, because we live in Northern Michigan. But before we begin, let me just uh, remind you that there will be an opportunity for you to ask Carl questions at the end of the talk. In order to do so, please submit your questions via the Zoom chat and we'll choose a number of them to ask. Unfortunately, we're not gonna be able to get to every question that's submitted, but we'll try to get as many as we can. As a preface to Carl's presentation, let me offer you these words from Aldo Leopold, considered by many to be the most influential environmentalist of the 20th century. He said, Ethical behavior is doing the right thing when no one else is watching, even when doing the wrong thing is legal. J. Carl Ganter began his journalism career in ninth grade at the Traverse City Record Eagle, writing obituaries, and went on to earn degrees from Northwestern University in Chicago. Since then, he's worked as a photojournalist for Time Magazine, Rolling Stone, and National Geographic. And as an investigative reporter, for NBC in Chicago. Some 15 years ago, he co-founded Circle of Blue, the award-winning nonprofit news organization that reports on water issues globally. For creating Circle of Blue's unique model of journalism, Carl received the Rockefeller Foundation Centennial Innovation Award. He has served as vice chairman of the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on Water Security and has presented or moderated sessions at the Aspen Ideas Festival, Aspen Environment Forum, Techonomy, World Water Week, Fung Global Institute, Concordia Summit, Impact Summit, International Water Summit, and the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Carl is also a founder of Vector Center, an impact-focused company that uses artificial intelligence to spot water and intersecting crisis before they happen. Carl, the stage is yours. Well, thanks so much, Jim. Uh, it's really great to be here. And especially uh, since World Water Day is on Monday. So just remember to celebrate. Um, and just a quick note, a special thanks to good friends, Karen and Jack Siegel and Bob and Nancy Giles for being such great mentors. And I have to welcome a special guest who's tuned in and that's my fifth grade teacher, Ann Rogers who taught me everything you'll hear today. So if you have any problems with what I say, please talk to her. <laughs> so it seems like we all have our water epiphany. And that's the moment when we realize that water flows through all of us and it defines the rise and fall of civilizations. Our moment could be a sunset over Lake Michigan or it could be a few weeks ago running out of water in Texas or we could be in the desert parched by the hot sun. It's the moment when we realize that water is magical and it's a source of life and that it's priceless, especially when it's gone. So besides growing up on the shores of Lake Michigan, my water epiphany started here on assignment for National Geographic with the US Deep Caving Team in Wakulla Springs, Florida. We were literally on a fantastic and dangerous voyage, scuba diving into the Earth's blue arteries of fresh water, deep underground. I'll never think of water under our feet the same way. But this evening, I'll take you to the front lines of the global water crises and talk about how we're going to solve some wicked problems. And yes, according to the Harvard Business Review, a wicked problem is real and it has many causes. It morphs constantly and it has no correct answer, but it can be tamed with the right approaches. I'll share some of the things that we can do together to tame these problems and help shift the world's dangerous course. But there are pivotal moments in history when the river takes one course or another, and this is really one of those moments. And at this moment, this moment for water, it's the story that is defining our future. And for a journalist, water is an incredible story. We have a drama that's unfolding around the world. It touch, it's touching everything that we care about, diversity, equity, justice, environment, health, security, art, and beauty. 
So from a journalist perspective, we've got news. Um, there are heroes and there are victims and there are even villains. And we have a storyline that rivals any adventure and we're all playing a role. So a quick reminder to put your questions in the chat, which we'll get to uh, toward the end here. But we're gonna start our story in orbit. So I asked astronaut Jerry Lininger about his perspective, what it was like to be circling the blue planet in the Russian space station near. And this is what he said. A closed ecosystem, only so many sources of life-sustaining water and all the creatures of Earth, just like the three of us circling it, all dependent on water. He spent four months in orbit around our tiny circle of blue in his own closed ecosystem. He had to make his drinking water from sweat and urine in space. And down here, while every drop counted to him, many of us don't even know where ours comes from. But we'd better start paying attention because it's profound what we do to get water. We build canals and we dam rivers and we pump wells, but Houston, we have a problem. Our blue planet is thirsty. So for multiple years in a row, the World Economic Forum has ranked water crises among the world's top five greatest threats. That's greater than weapons of mass destruction, even greater than pandemics. So there's good reason for the ranking and most of the numbers are getting worse. So thousands of children die each day from preventable waterborne diseases. And this is in Vasant Kunj, one of Delhi's poorest neighborhoods where women, it's usually the young women who wait for water. And the World Bank estimates that half of the world's population will live in water stress regions by 2025. That's just in a few years. This is a significant migration trigger. And here in Sao Paulo, the people live in these favelas of Portolina. They're farmers who've moved to the city because their crops have failed due to drought. And I found, found the irony especially poignant and the muddy alleys were named for the villages that they left behind. And dozens of cities face, or dozens of cities worldwide face what a clever headline writer in Cape Town called day zero. That's the day when the reservoirs, the wells, and the taps could go dry. And yes, Miami and London are on the list. And here I photograph crews laying a private water pipeline in Jakarta, Indonesia. And some 70% of fresh water use is consumed by agriculture, growing food for a growing and hungry population. It takes a lot of water. And energy is thirsty too. Energy needs water to mine coal, extract oil and gas, cool thermopower plants, and to generate electricity from hydropower. Water needs energy also. It takes massive amounts of energy to move and treat water. These are the legacy oil wells in Azerbaijan. It's a disaster where water and oil don't mix. And so in many cities worldwide, Many also can't afford to pay for the most basic water service. While I was photographing Rebecca Fritz in her home in Detroit, the postman came and he brought her water bill, $1,400. It's a bill she can't afford to pay. At Circle of Blue, we reported this year that, Circle of Blue, or that Chicago is owed nearly half a billion dollars in overdue water bills. That puts pressure on budgets and system investments. And then there's climate change. It's definitely the force multiplier. Climate is water. And here's a quote that's especially appropriate, I think, for us now. If climate change is the shark, water is the teeth. Warmer temperatures, floods, and droughts are already stressing food and energy security and political stability. So this is Urumqi in far west China. It's at the end of this historic Silk Road. And the city's water supplies for 4 million residents come from the glaciers and the mountains in the background, which are receding rapidly. So indeed, the future is here, and it's here ahead of schedule. If you look closely in this picture, you can count hundreds of water tanks on these buildings in Delhi. 
And so I'm a, I'm a reporter, and these stories can't be told remotely. It's hard to identify with statistics. And so we use a secret process. We call it IWT. And it stands for, I was there. And we know that this shift, that we, <laughs> we know that we can shift this dangerous course by better understanding the complexities and making these stories real and relevant. So back to Jerry and back to Orbit. He told me he would look out his window and see dust storms stretching from Inner Mongolia to Beijing and all the way to Los Angeles. His water epiphany were all connected. So I wondered if Jerry dropped a golf ball out of his window over the dust storms, where would it land? Where were these storms starting? So clearly I'm obviously not a physicist or an astronaut, but it would land right here the coal mines of Inner Mongolia, the front lines of China's water energy nexus, and some of the front lines of climate change. From the plane, I saw a little barn in the distance in the upper left corner, you can see a speck. <laughs> so I'm from the Midwest and I learned to play in the neighbor's yard in the late afternoon. And that way I can invite myself to stay for dinner if it was more interesting than what we were having at home. And so I took the only taxi at the airport across the frozen grasslands and went there, IWT. I knocked on the door and basically said, I'm from Michigan. And I think the taxi driver kind of just shrugged and the shepherds were home and they let me in. Thank heavens. I found Wu Yun and she's a shepherd's daughter. She told me that the family's well has gone dry because the mines have drained the groundwater. They now have, fifth, have to drive 15 kilometers to fetch water for their sheep. And we sat and drank mayor's milk tea while the fi family wondered how I happened to just show up at their door in 25 below zero weather. In Jakarta, there's another challenge and it's that it's a day zero city whose water is under multiple threats. It's a city that's sinking due to overdraft of groundwater and rising sea levels. In the upper right corner is the thin seawall that holds back the ocean from, the flood, from flooding the homes of millions. I was literally standing there on the morning when the central government announced that it would move the capital from Jakarta in part due to water risk. In the upper left are the pumping stations that run 24 hours a day, seven days a week to move water and raw sewage up and over the seawall to the ocean. And these pumps are massive. And in the, in the neighborhoods, we found people like Parina. She was desperately waiting for a water delivery so she could run her tiny sidewalk restaurant. She pays about 10% of her income for water delivery. A few minutes later, here comes the water. Ilang appeared to deliver it. Some 5 million residents rely on water deliveries from vendors like him. His push cart weighs about 1,000 pounds. So around the world, more and more people walk or wait for water. So I made a short video diary to share here to give a sense of what that feels like. It's a typical morning as Delhi awakens to its usual chaos, its legendary traffic jams and vendors on the street and beggars faces longingly pressed against car windows selling flowers. But like many of the world's urban centers, Delhi is thirsty, even parched. As the third largest population center in the world, its 25 million people need water, and lots of it just to survive. On this day, I want to learn more about how millions of people live literally bucket to bucket, not necessarily knowing when and if their water will come. So I take my camera to the neighborhood of Sangram Vihar, one of the city's countless informal poor communities where every drop does count. On this summer day, on a street made muddy by leaking sewage pipes, we come across women who have gathered to fill buckets and barrels from a water truck as it makes its delivery. They pay for the tanker to deliver water because the city's connections aren't reliable, are unsafe, or aren't even available at all. As the truck leaves, there are smiles of relief on this steamy day. While they may or may not have a toilet, they can take comfort in knowing that their families will have water to drink and to wash with in the week ahead. Yet many parts of India are not even as fortunate. Unlike the delivery truck, 
the water never came. Areas of the nation like Rajasthan to the west have faced one of the driest periods in history and in May, the hottest weeks ever recorded when temperatures reached 51 degrees centigrade. That's 124 degrees Fahrenheit. Water scarcity and blinding heat have disrupted farming and energy production, the two largest users of water in the country. And the cruel irony here in Delhi is that many living in the poorest informal neighborhoods like this one are indeed water refugees. There are families from nearby states like Rajasthan and Bundelkhand where fiercely persistent drought and overpumping has caused wells to go dry, farms to go bankrupt, and some farmers even to take their own lives. It's clear that how India responds in the next months and years will have effects for generations. How will it manage the intensifying competition between water, food, and energy in a changing climate? So India is increasingly becoming one of the most water insecure countries in the world. And today, some 40% of India's population doesn't have access to safe drinking water services, and less than 4% have access to safe sanitation. And one of the persistent problems facing our water-based economies is a serious disconnect between perception and reality. So in Punjab, India, farmers believe that groundwater is infinite. They've lobbied for free electricity and you know, when electricity is free, you leave the lights on. Here, they let their pumps run 24 seven, even when they don't need to irrigate. It's truly mutual assured depletion. But what happens when the wells do go dry? So near Delhi, I was with farmers whose wells had gone dry, but why were their crops still green? And how were they able to plant rice? Where was the water coming from? These women were working, the water these women were working in didn't smell just like ordinary raw sewage. I've smelled a lot. It smelled more like industrial waste. And so we followed the canals upstream to paper mills like this one. They were irrigating with industrial waste contaminated with heavy metals and chemicals. So you can see some of the water runoff to the right that goes off to the canals that they pump from. And the farmers said they've come to rely on the supply from the factories and tanneries for irrigation. And in Bangalore, we found farmers washing their produce, produce like beets, and washing it at a station like this that actually pumps groundwater from deeper underground. Well, why were they washing the beets? It was because their wells had gone dry. They were irrigating with raw sewage. And we also found that they don't eat their own produce. They grow it separately. They ship the food to the cities. So when we talk about water and the water and food connection, it's not just about scarcity. It's about food safety and security and a global supply chain all affected by water. And this is the, what the end of the supply chain looks like in Delhi. This is at Asia's largest wholesale food market. For scale, I counted some 40 trucks, semi-trucks of onions alone, just like this one, delivered every day. And so in other parts of the world, there's a water food crucible as well, and on the front lines of climate change. So they went to the mouth of the Mekong River in Vietnam during rice harvest, but it may be the last harvest here south of Kento. On this day, literally this day when I took this picture, Salt water was measured 78 kilometers upriver, and that was a new record. And the rice paddies are turning brown because of the salt. Vietnam is the world's second largest rice exporter, and sea level rise is an existential threat to some of the most productive lands on the planet. We found some entrepreneurs finding new business and turning their rice paddies into shrimp farms. What a great idea. But literally when I turned around from this spot, the only thing between this farmer and his new shrimp farm and a rising ocean was plastic sticks and mud. And we learned just over a month ago in Texas where we saw the systemic effects of extreme weather, a likely result of climate change. The impacts were dramatic across infrastructure. Some places still have water issues, some places in the, in the American South. And when water and energy supplies come to a halt in cities like Austin, Houston, and San Antonio, it's a massive disruption, as you can see. 
There are things that we can plan for though. I took this picture a few years ago in Lake Travis in Austin, a major reservoir was at a record low. So we can predict droughts and we can predict floods and we can predict rainfall, we can better prepare. But I live on the shores of 20% of the world's surface water, the Great Lakes. And I'm always incredibly grateful to come home and see sites like this. I was flying back to Chicago from the Middle East and those are the Leelna and old mission peninsulas of Michigan in the distance. I, I wish they could have just dropped me off and I had to go to Chicago first. Um, but even the greatest of lakes aren't immune. In the Great Lakes and around the world, as we grow food, we drill more wells for irrigation. As we drill more wells, we generate more one runoff from our fields, which can lead to dangerous algae blooms. Lake Erie is now, now consistently experiences harmful algae blooms several times a year. It was so intense in 2014 that Toledo residents there were without drinking water for days. But we can also learn from other parts of the world like Southwest China, what not to do and what to do. We met this farmer in his fields in Yunnan province. His, the hillsides had been denuded during China's Great Leap Forward in the late 1950s. The topsoil is washing away and it's washing into underground limestone caverns, ironically, just like those in Florida where we were exploring years before. And just behind me was a sinkhole that had opened up literally hundreds of feet deep. And this is one result. Persistent mats of algae clay, really clog Lake Kunming, the result of untreated sewage and agricultural runoff. It's the source of drinking water for millions of people. So what do we do? Well, Sir David Attenborough says that saving our planet is a communications challenge. But first, we have to break our assumptions. This is not easy work, and the world's not a click away. This is the data center at the Punjab Department of Irrigation. And I was really careful not to wake up the servers. For any data geeks out there, that's supposed to be a joke. Um, but at the same time, we're in a new era of connectivity, of empowerment and participation. This man in Hyderabad takes pictures every day of this river that runs past his home and garden. And the foam from factories upstream overflows the banks and it actually flows into, it, into his home sometimes and his garden. If he only knew who to send the pictures to. So a side note, um, the stuff isn't good. The bottoms of my shoes fell off a few days later. We tried to have the water tested, but couldn't easily find a qualified lab. But more and more, the world is connected and we're setting up frameworks to understand those connections much better. And we learn, we've learned that what happens in Inner Mongolia affects California, even Michigan, and it will take a true systems approach to solve these wicked problems. These are the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Number six is water. And of course, water connects with all of them. It connects with hunger, with gender equality, with responsible consumption and production, with sustainable cities and communities, with industry, innovation, and infrastructure, with clean energy. And perhaps the most important is number 17, collaboration across all of them. And the good news here is that companies and some governments are stepping up. Pragmatically, companies see the risks of their bottom lines and their customers and their communities. Even companies like Unilever have made unprecedented commitments to climate and water. They've even canceled their quarterly reports because they put too much pressure on the immediate versus the long-term bottom line, which includes something they call ESG, environment, social, and governments, governance targets. And groups like the World Economic Forum our leading action on setting scientific targets for restoring our water, biodiversity, climate, and oceans balance. And we're working with Microsoft to bring the latest tools of artificial intelligence and big data and remote sensing to realign perception and reality. So when farmers in India think they have water, we can more quickly demonstrate the reality. And on the collaboration side, News media and others are starting to work together. And these are really important stories and we shouldn't have to tell them alone. 
So here's just one example of what we're doing in the Great Lakes with three other leading outlets. Record-setting high water. Shoreline erosion. Toxic algae blooms. The Great Lakes have issues. As journalists, we wanted to understand the Great Lakes better, so we formed a partnership. Together, we'll cover the critical issues that the people of the Great Lakes are facing. What will climate change mean for our region? Will we become a climate refuge? Is our infrastructure ready for that? You can follow all the work at circleofblue.org. This independent journalism is supported by the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation. So we're really excited to be working with a team of, of journalists across the Great Lakes Basin and really collaborating in our efforts and, and sharing, our, sharing our superpowers really, because we are learning that there are consequences of inaction. The Flint tragedy was a true wake up call. There are health and legal consequences for indifference. When I visited Flint, literally knocked on this home and this young man opened his, opened his home to me and when I photographed him, his eyes cut right through me. He was worried that his daughter may have been permanently harmed by lead in the water. And I happened to literally walk in on her birthday party. So around the world, companies are understanding the need for transparency and accountability and a social license to operate. It's harder to be a bad actor today. Protesters in Catamarca, Peru, shut down a $5 billion gold mine because of water pollution. And Wall Street is paying attention now, too. And the leadership happening in interesting places. Um, in Mongolia Parliament, we literally turned the chairs around. They'd never done that before. Probably also somebody like me had never gotten in trouble in Parliament before. You see my empty chair there. Well. Somebody took a picture of me standing on the furniture to get the shot. I did take off my shoes. But, and we brought together unlikely institutions like the Vatican to activate their networks and leak big conversations. How do we align our values with the value of water? In 2017 on World Water Day, March 22nd, um, we were at the Vatican and hosted a three-day event which was opened by Pope Francis. But we have to keep asking, really, how serious are we in solving these problems? At the moment, we are slipping backwards. We face information overload, which leads to indifference and fragmenting audiences. And we lack the clear narratives to make the water crisis understandable for leaders and policymakers and citizens to take immediate action. And decision grade data is often siloed, out of context, slow, <laughs> or not available at all. And many of the sustainable development goals naturally fall into their own silos. So we're not making the cross connections fast enough and our policies are not keeping up. And people, those in most dire need or those who make decisions, finance solutions or implement policy, they need to feel relevancy and urgency. They need to see themselves in the picture. So this lack of shared perspective and shared story creates a dangerous dynamic and perhaps our greatest impediment to scaled and coordinated response. Without public awareness and connective action, policymakers, executives, and investors have little incentive to prioritize water over more prominent issues. That is until the taps run dry. And those working on the ground may have a shared purpose, but they haven't found their shared story. And so to avoid serious imminent disruptions for business, people, and the planet, it requires far more than awareness and more than money and more than celebrity, more than expertise and more than traditional risk analysis. It requires an effort just as tenacious and adaptive as the problems themselves. Because this isn't a story just about sanitation and hygiene, and it's not a story about infrastructure or policy, and it's not a story about technology, food, or energy, or climate. Yes, it's a story about all of these. And so let me leave you the few ways to motivate and activate more people from the most vulnerable in our communities to the most promising young scientists and to our leadership. We need to tell better stories and be compelling and gracious and inclusive and mindful of our silos. We need to capture hearts and minds and understand why do we care? People need to see themselves in the picture. 
And we need to make the statistics real from the Mekong Delta and the farms in Delhi to the Great Lakes and even the global commodities markets. We need to make the connections real. And we need to realize that this is the most important story unfolding around the planet because water is the blue thread that weaves the tapestry of history. And whether journalists or esteemed ministers or Mongolian shepherds, this is our story to write. It's the story for action and for science and discovery and for inclusiveness across all the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And perhaps the most important piece of the story is about becoming better listeners, listening for the moments when stories of innovation can overcome adversity because they're the stories of our inspiration and they will become the stories of our history. So you remember Wu Yun. So I went back a year later and the mines had gotten closer. I took this from literally from their front, front step there. And I went back again and the grasslands were turning to sand. And yes, I went back again and there was a new coal, uh, coal processing plant that connected all of the mines with giant conveyor belts. And as we unnoted to me, we used uh, WeChat and other apps for communications. I don't speak Chinese. The groundwater there is unsafe to drink. When I was hiking with Wu Yan and her boyfriend, we stopped near a temple on a mountaintop and they pulled out these stunning traditional clothes. And they asked me to, they handed me their cell phone. And I said, no, 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 I, I have a real camera and they asked me to take their engagement photos. And so this is Wu Yan's then fiance and now husband. And a little surprise for all of us as I asked them over the weekend to share some new pictures with all of us. And so they sent us a nice little postcard and this is from Shilinghat, Inner Mongolia. But my point here is that behind every statistic is a person, a culture, a story. A story like Stephen Lewis of the Gila River Nation in Arizona, who pledges to make his nation the most sustainable nation in the world. And the young women who carry water every day, all while hoping they can someday go to school. And then there's Beryl Carmichael, an Aboriginal elder in Australia, who traces her ancestry across rivers of time and water. One of my most profound moments was sitting in the outback with Beryl, um, literally around a pot of kangaroo stew under the stars, no lights except for the light of the fire. And she was the telling the stories of her rivers that flow back into time through centuries and thousands of years of ancestors. And then this Indian farmer took me by the hand at sunrise to show me his wealth his water. And I thought of that profound quote from the little prince. What makes the desert beautiful is that somewhere it hides a well. And staying with this Marasi family near the Pakistan border, and that's my bed. You can see the, the red cover in the upper left there. So I slept outside with the family, too hot to be inside. And they allowed me to go with the young girls to fetch water before sunrise. And by mid morning, the temperature was already at 115 degrees. So every day when the news or the challenges may feel overwhelming, I think about the people I meet along this journey and what an honor it is to tell their story as part of this blue thread that we all grasp together. That's because water is the story of all of us. So Jim, I saved a little extra time because I know we'll have some questions coming in. So back to you. Thank you, Carl, for a very thought provoking presentation. And let's just let me reiterate to the students that are watching today. All these climate issues will not be resolved, perhaps in my lifetime, but they may be in yours. However, you must make a concerted effort to build that type of world for the next generation. And we really hope you you can. It doesn't mean we're taking our hands off it. As you can, as Carl mentioned, there are a lot of people working for it, and, and we want you to continue <clears throat> to uh, carry the banner on that. So let's look at a, a few questions that we have. Uh, this one's from Kennard Weaver. Kennard says, "What effect do, does companies pumping up groundwater to sell in plastic bottles have on the Great Lakes?" 
Uh, that's a great question. Um, and what, what effect does that have, not just on the Great Lakes, but around the world? Um, so you mentioned plastic bottles, number one, <laughs> um, and that's just the, the, pure, uh, the pure waste stream, a huge, huge problem. Um, and then, of course, the whole idea that you know, we're packaging water um, and shipping it, uh, the carbon footprint, uh, obviously, and then getting to the point is literally pumping the water out of the ground. Um, but it really does beg a bigger story. So I personally, I don't drink bottled water. Um, it's cheaper to fill up my mug. Um, but it's a bigger question about what is our water budget and what are we going to spend it on, literally? What's the water budget we need to set aside for the environment, uh, for our Great Lakes, um, for, our, you know, for our, our drinking water, for our irrigation? So not only is bottled water definitely a deep concern, particularly when it's pumped from the ground. Um, some brands literally buy water from municipalities, filter it, and put it in plastic bottles. Um, but uh, imagine thousands of new wells being drilled for irrigation. These are industrial wells, similar to the size of many bottled water plants. And so we really have to understand, we have to have a better idea of what we're pulling our water out of the ground for and what we're using it for, and is that sustainable? So you know, here in Michigan, uh, we have definitely a bottled water issues and controversies, um, issues that bring up uh, the whole idea of uh, the global commons and the Great Lakes commons, who owns the water, who controls the water, are we shipping water out of the Great Lakes? A lot of questions tied to bottled water, but then also a lot of questions we are just starting to ask around back to climate change. How will potentially a shift in where people live, not just where people live, but how we grow our crops, how is that going to affect our groundwater supplies and our surface water supplies? In the Ogallala Aquifer, for example, the central US, um, we, it, it is, it's shrinking dramatically. And so we need to be really looking at um, where we're growing our crops, how we're irrigating, and how we're using our water. So bottled water is a major part of that equation, um, but it's also uh, a really significant um, uh, way into a much bigger story. Thank you, Carl. And let me, I'm going to combine a couple of questions here from a couple of our viewers that have to do with population. And, and the lack of water because of population growth. One of the students asks, um, as a result of this growth, where is that water going? Uh, is, is there a, obviously a, a direct effect? Yeah, so really good question. Um, so, well, one part of the good news is it's not leaving the planet. Um, <laughs> so we are not losing water off the, off the planet. Um, but the population pressures definitely, definitely a major concern. You know, more people living in cities than any time in, in history. Um, and so, you know, how are we going to manage those population pressures? Um, most experts believe that with better water management, and I, that means not only just drinking water, but that means the other side, which is wastewater management. And so, uh, wastewater and also, I mean, basically sewage, but then also persistent pollution, chemical pollution, industrial waste, which we saw a little bit here. Um, so the good news on the population side is that when in communities that traditionally have not had, say, regular access to safe drinking water, when, when they have safe drinking water, the population rate goes, starts to drop. People have fewer children and those children are educated. They actually have time to go to school. So the young woman I went with that morning in near in, in the desert near pa near the border of Pakistan, not only was it you know painful, that was a long walk and it was hot. By the time we got back, it was starting to hit about 100 degrees. These girls don't have time to go to school because they have to make that trek a couple times a day to bring water back to the family. And so by solving the water crises, um, and again I'm talking about water delivery, um, and I'm also talking about wastewater treatment. So we don't end up in a situation like Jakarta. We can solve so many of the other problems. Thank you. This one's from Josie. She says, uh, great photos and narration, Carl. Very serious message. What do you recommend we do at the local, state, and national level to advocate for protecting water quality and quantity? That's a great question. Um, you know, most, a lot of times, well, 
okay, I'll take a shorter shower, right? Um, and or I'll you know, do some lifestyle changes. I'll cut back on uh, my water footprint. And I actually, I would encourage people to go to the Water Footprint Network online and just see the different products or drinks or you know, beef, chicken, how much water it actually takes uh, to grow or make the things we use every day. So what do we do about this? Well, you can take a shorter shower and the calculus in that is actually pretty interesting um, because if you do the numbers, depending on where you are, um, sometimes you actually save more water uh, by saving by the energy that's not used to pump and treat the water coming to you. So you take a shorter shower, use less water, the actually the energy return on that is significant. And so you're using less coal to run the coal fired power plant and to mine the coal, they use water. So to wash the coal. And so there are all these follow along pieces, but truly today in the good news here is we pretty much have all the technologies we need. Um, to run our systems, our cities much more efficiently, to treat our water, to move it efficiently. Um, but the real, the real challenge and the really roadblock is truly policy. You know, we have to one, make, you know, make our companies and our governments and our leaders understand the role that water plays across everything um, and the risk that's at stake. You know, what we're seeing is, is companies like, you know, companies like Microsoft a year ago in January, they made a huge climate commitment to be not just climate, you know, better, but literally to go back and be climate negative or neutral all the way back through their history since the company started. And they also made a huge water commitment. So we're seeing almost this arms race, a positive race between companies and Wall Street is starting to hold them accountable, as I mentioned, with something called ESG rankings. Um, just in January, BlackRock announced, one of the big, huge hedge funds, announced that they, um, that they actually have now a whole ESG measurement system. They will be investing in companies that are meeting the sustainable development goals, gold targets and that are monitoring their environment, social, and governance. And so truly it is about making our friends, our neighbors, and our leaders see themselves in the picture. And that, that sounds kind of like a, a soft answer, but oftentimes a, a minister is pressured to build a road or do they build a pipeline that you can't see? So we have to make that much more visible, make the economics visible, and also make the political risk of inaction visible. Yeah, well said. I, I think that's, that's very important. So this is a question I know you get a lot. Uh, and it has to do with desalinization. And uh, again, we that was implemented many years ago, right? And people are continually asking that question. Is it viable? Is it cost effective? Uh, how come we're not doing more of that? And there are a couple of questions that relate to that. So could you kind of enlighten us on that, Carl? Um, sure. And actually, I'll put, I just happen to have a picture handy. <laughs> um, so this is a desal plant in, uh, in Qatar, in Doha. Um, they have three of these plants. I think they're building another one, but um, this, the infrastructure needed to build a desal plant, um, you know, the bottom line is there is no silver bullet. Um, it's kind of like that little squeeze toy. You know, you squeeze one side and the ear pops out, <laughs> squeeze the other side. So there are definite, um, uh, you know, uh, consequences. This is what these plants look like. They are complicated. They are massive. And this is, again, that same plant in Doha. The amount of natural gas and the pipelines, the amount of natural gas and energy it takes to desal water is massive. So it comes back to this, um, this investment and return. Um, in many senses, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. You'll pretty much never use desal water for irrigation for crops. And like I said, you know, we use about 70, depending where you are, sometimes 90% of our water for growing food. Um, so for a balance, you know, again, it's an economic question. Um, usually the cheapest thing to do is literally to replace uh, in a city is to replace leaky toilets um, and replace leaky pipelines. And a last point on that is in many cities like Mexico City, um, they sometimes lose 40% of their water supplies um, through leaky pipes. And so by fixing those and investing in the long-term infrastructure, usually the economic return is much greater than investing in something like desal. 
Great, thank you. Yeah, and that the uh, question regarding desalinization that came from Ken and also Taylor. So thank you for those. Mm -hmm. Mike has a question. The conflict in Syria began with water insecurity. In fact, it was a drought. Cross-border conflicts and migration to find a better life seem to be on the rise. Can nation states fix this or do we need to look beyond for an international solution? Wow, that is an awesome question. This, this is the International Affairs Forum, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so actually uh, a, another future forum would be ideal on, on resource risk and, and potential conflict. Um, there's a little bit of a good news, uh, a good news to a really tough story. You know, it was a few years ago, people would always lean over and say, and almost whisper in your ear and say, you know, the next world wars or the next wars will be fought over water. And I used to kind of just kind of smile and say, well, they already are. You know, we mentioned Arab Spring, mentioned Syria. Um, you know, the U.S. military, the Pacific Command runs scenarios around climate change and freshwater scarcity and, you know, say a failure of a major system in, say, Chennai, India. Let's say Chennai's groundwater um, turns saline overnight because of sea level rise. What do we do with millions of people on the move? And that becomes a global security issue, you know, global migration. And so what we need to do is really when we're talking about climate security, and this comes into all the, the reinvigorated climate talks now is we really do need to be talking about water and water security and those kind of transboundary relationships because rivers don't necessarily know political boundaries and neither does groundwater either. Um, look at, you know, Ogallala, different states. Um, and look at our friends in, you know, in Punjab. And one farmer is pumping, if one farmer's pumping, the next one's got to pump because he's afraid that the other farmer is going to get more water and maybe grow a little bit more, um, uh, whatever they're growing. I think they're, they're growing winter wheat at the time. Um, so yes, this is a, a deep concern, uh, particularly for uh, the U.S. State Department. And we've been involved in some uh, scenario sessions, um, also did a project with the State Department in Chennai, India, looking at exactly these types of scenarios. Great. Since the, uh, the title of this, this presentation had to do with climate, water, and food, we have a question from Gloria that asks, would you address diet and the water that is required for a meat-heavy diet versus a plant-based mm -hmm. diet? Aha, uh -huh. um, really good question. Um, and that's a, that's a deep concern because it takes, and depend, the numbers are different depending where you are um, in, in the world, but it takes a lot more water to raise beef and chicken uh, and pork um, than it does to say a vegetarian di diet. So there is actually a deep concern if parts of the world that are traditionally vegetarian uh, move toward a, a heavy meat diet. And so that is, you know, that's definitely the water footprint, like I mentioned. Um, again, I would go to the water footprint network. Um, I don't have the graphic handy, I usually do, but um, it's, uh, it's really, eye-opening to see. And so, you know, if literally if there's something you want to do and you don't want to get involved in the, in the policy or the, you know, local government on these issues, yes, take a shorter shower, but also look in your refrigerator and look at your shopping list and see you can cut your water use dramatically through what they call embedded water. Interesting. Phil asked the question, he says, it strikes me that many water problems are classic cases of the commons. How do we regulate a commodity? Ah, so that opens up a whole big question, you know, is water a commodity, right? Um, but it's, we have ourselves, you know, in a sense, the global commons, it's air, it's water. Um, you know, we have a, a terrific expert here in, in, in the region, Jim Olson, who's done a lot of research around uh, water in the commons and commons law. Um, there's actually a big movement afoot, and it's actually called the Global Commons Alliance. And it's based on what they call scientific-based targets. Um, and this is something the World Economic Forum and many of the uh, leading policy institutions and environmental organizations are working on and research institutions. One, what are the planetary 
boundaries. How far can we push ourselves in water and in climate? Again, there's a, there's a reaction and there's a, you know, opposite reaction. Um, and so how do we, um, how do we manage this in a much more, in an equitable way? Now, there are some, you know, there's, there's the argument that water should be free, right? Water should be free for everyone. Um, the way around that is you, if you make it, you can't make it free for everyone because then you can't have a, a municipal delivery system. So the way around that is coming up with, in a sense, a basic human right to water, which the UN has, has you know, supported and the US has signed on to, and then actually build in the pricing structure for delivering that water. But it all does come back to, you know, it comes back to the accountability and transparency. You know, we need to be looking at, you know, our agriculture and our energy production and the water footprint that it all has. And how are we moving that water intentionally or unintentionally? Um, that's, that's, when it, that's really what the Global Commons is all about. It's understanding those systemic and system interactions. Great, and just for clarification, Carl, uh, Anne asks, what is embedded water? And you mentioned that. So yeah, so embedded water, if I pick up my phone, how much water did it take to make that silicon chip? You know, a, a chip, uh, in fact, it's a good example, um, a, uh, you know, a chip plant, manufacturing plant um, uses a lot of water and it needs really clean water. Um, so actually we did a scenario session. Um, it's really, really interesting. Um, we did a scenario session in China. Uh, what happens if it was a three day workshop uh, with, uh, with leaders and ministers, what happens if the yellow river goes below a certain level? And so, you know, that, that would be like an embedded water flow, but how much water do you need to run your power plants, uh, to move your goods, um, to cool your power plants? And within, if, if the Yellow River went below a certain level, I can't remember what exactly what it was, but let's say the power plants don't have enough water to cool themselves and there's not enough water to move, move, move the fuel, whether it's coal or oil or, or whatever else. Um, then what happens is that there'll be brownouts and then the factories switch over to diesel fuel. And then there are traffic jams because of the trucks hauling diesel fuel. It's an amazing follow on. And so, you know, again, back to the embedded water um, and being able to, uh, you know, improve our production, but also not just for materials, but in getting back to food um, and understanding how much water it takes to produce something, producing our, you know, those goods um, in places where there is more, more abundant water rather than trying to say grow food in the desert. Um, so there's a there's some really great uh, great cal calculus that's going on to help us with those decisions. But truly, it is about transparency and accountability, and getting back to that baseline. How are we going to use our water budget? Yeah, transparency and accountability uh, that can should should work for a lot of things, right? In theory. Yeah. yeah. Uh, David, David has a question here. Why is there no mention of the quantity of water used to generate electricity by steam-driven turbines equal to three times the flow over Niagara Falls? Ah, that's a great question. Well, there, I, I definitely brought it up. I, I, I pointed out, I used, I put in an Azerbaijan picture because I thought it was interesting. But the, when you see the, uh, when you see the, you know, coal-fired power plants or thermal plants, I mean, first off, you know, you saw you saw the impact in Texas uh, when the pipelines froze and they couldn't cool the plants. Um, so one, back to those mines in Inner Mongolia, they use a lot of water for mining and processing coal, right? So they literally wash the coal. They have to quote clean the coal to burn it. They wash all the other stuff out. Um, and so what happens is you end up with, you know, a mass amount of water in that whole kind of energy generation uh, um, equation. But one interesting thing that we saw is the reporting that we did in China. Um, we did, we sent four separate teams across China to look at exactly this question. What is the relationship between water and energy and coal? And we just asked the question, does China have enough water to continue mining and processing coal at current rates. Well, after a lot of legwork and staying with Mongolian shepherds and visiting power plants and mines and you know uh, statistics bureaus, um, we were able to actually make that calculation that 
China doesn't have enough water to mine and process coal at current rates. So for the other half of the other hour and a half of my presentation, I would take you back to Inner Mongolia again. Um, those coal mines in the background, behind those were some massive thermoelectric coal-fired power plants, convenient, right, near the mines. But they were cooling those plants with groundwater. So they're pulling the water out of the ground, pushing it up into the atmosphere in the giant cooling towers that you see, um, and literally just draining the aquifer to cool their power plants. And also, of course, to mine the coal. The last time I went back, those huge, and we did the reporting, um, and we actually did scenario sessions across China. We did 17 convenings across China. We met with a water minister of China, um, and he was actually thrilled by the news we brought him. We brought him bad news, but we gave him standing because now he had standing that Circle of Blue and our partner, the Wilson Center, says that I'm relevant because if you want to fill that canal or cool that power plant, you've got to talk to me, right? So when I went back to Inner Mongolia the last time, two of these massive coal-fired thermoelectric power plants were gone, literally gone. It would take us 10 years to tear one down here, but it was gone. It was just a massive cement pad. You know what was behind it? Solar, a solar farm as far as you could see, and a wind farm even farther. So literally, they were dri driven toward renewables because of water shortage. And when we presented, after we presented, we got a call from the US State Department, this is a few years ago, that when President Obama and President Xi of China signed our climate, the pre-Paris climate agreement, that we had two of the six points because they worked into, the, into their plan, the water energy relationship. So we were able to, so that's a really kind of uh, empowering feeling that, yes, we went to the fields, inner Mongolian shepherds, right? <laughs> At the edge of the coal mines. We took that story literally to the ministers and it made it all the way up, uh, all the way up to policy. Great. We have time for about two more questions. I'm going to uh, recite this one. And this is from Susan and she's uh, really pulling back the policy curtain on this one. And she's asking, who is running the total systems cost impacts of current practices and how can priority issues be brought into the national conversation? Um, wow, um, that's a complicated question. Um, you know, it's, it's you know, and I, I touched on this and this is probably more because I'm, I come from the journalism world, um, but it really, it, it does come down to cost. You know, it's, it's left brain, right brain, right? So you have to have the spreadsheet side, which do the numbers add up. How do we, um, you know, how, how do we do the calculus that shows that investing in infrastructure, investing in con conservation and watersheds um, has a, you know, a, a, real, um, a real value, a real return. And we know it does, but when you can put a number on it, that way you can actually put a political risk on it if there is, uh, or even a, a business risk on it, um, if there's a lack of action. Um, so coming back to really just driving that, that policy, um, it's about, and we already said it, sorry, I sound like a broken record, but it is a, about that accountability and transparency. And it's about that relevancy, relevancy. So we have to meet our leaders within their framework. Um, so if they're all about numbers, then show them the numbers. If they're all about, um, you know, all about the, um, the the clean water, which we should be, right? Um, then make that super clear too. But also, what's interesting is that, and and this is the beginning of a movement, and we're seeing this, is that companies are now starting to lobby. And I came back to this whole ESG thing, um, environment, social, and governance. They're actually lobbying for stronger standards. Um, so there is good news on that front. Great. And then for our last question, I'm going to combine a question from Marsha and from Nick. And they ask in combination, what is Michigan doing officially to plan for the future of, future of our water use and our needs? And Nick asks, what innovations related to water usage are you seeing that give you hope? Ah, okay. <laughs> um, well, what are we doing in Michigan? I actually would really um, uh, encourage people to come to Circle of Blue, the Circle of Blue website. Um, I'll put up the URLs here. 
is uh, we just did a project with the Great Lakes, uh, our Great Lakes News Consortium on, and we're ongoing on climate change. And are we ready um, policy-wise? So are we ready, one, for infrastructure? Are we ready, do we understand, you know, our groundwater? Um, do we understand how much groundwater there is um, and how we're going to use a limited supply? And the other question too um, that we brought up and we just published a few weeks ago, are we ready for potential migration, uh, uh, you know, population migration northwards uh, with climate change? Um, so there are some huge policy questions to ask and also, you know, frankly, we are behind in our infrastructure. It's something that we just generally fail to, to invest in. Sorry, the other half of the question. Uh, what innovations do you see for the That's future okay. that give so, you hope? Yeah, so the innovations that give me hope um, is truly, you know, coming back to the back to the data and the context. I mean, some of the things that we're doing, some of the things that uh, uh, companies like Microsoft are doing. Um, for making these issues and making the numbers much more relevant and visible and much more democratized so they're available to all of us. Great. Well, thank you, Carl, for sharing your expertise and being with us today. We really appreciate that. I think uh, no one can go away from this conversation without uh, having learned something. That's, that's definitely- Or maybe being a little thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So, and thank you to all of our um, Inter International Affairs Forum members who are here with us today. Please join us next month on April 15th when we offer a poignant conversation with Dr. Courtney Radish on protecting press freedom globally and locally. Thank you for being here.